Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Since 2012, Gangnam Style has been watched over 2 billion times on YouTube. Young people all around the world are listening to K-pop, various Korean celebrities have found a global audience, and the tale of Korea's economic success is now known to all. Yet how do we explain this infatuation with Korea and its cultural exports, to the extent that the term Hallyu, or Korean wave, was coined to describe this phenomenon? To answer this question, we sat down with Daniel Tudor. Daniel is a British writer who holds a degree in philosophy, politics and economics from the University of Oxford, an MBA from the University of Manchester, and moved to Korea a decade ago. Since then, he has worked as Korea correspondent for The Economist, he has been published in several Korean newspapers, and he opened a chain of craft beer pubs in Seoul. He is the author of two books on Korea. The first one, Korea, the Impossible Country, was published in 2012. His new book, A Geek in Korea, Discovering Asia's New Kingdom of Cool, is out now. Daniel, welcome to Korea in the World. Thank you. Reading your book, Korea, the Impossible Country, it felt that it's also about your experience navigating Korean society and Korean culture. It's about your own journey. So what brought you to Korea and how does a, how does a foreigner end up writing books, so to speak? Well, I first came for the uh, World Cup of 2002. Uh, I was a university student back then. My best friend at university was Korean, and I'm sure he still is. Uh, he invited me. Uh, his, his father got some tickets for games. And so he and I and two other guys went over and it changed my life. It was just the best, it's still the best time I've ever had in my whole life. And Korea was crazy then. Uh, just this sense of abandon and just every night go out, get crazily drunk. Everyone's your brother or your sister. And it's, it's such sort of friendliness and no barriers between people. Uh, and so yeah, that was, it was quite, uh, yeah, it was a time that just left a big impression on me. And I thought, well, you know, after I graduate, it would be quite nice to go back for maybe one year. Now, a lot of people, they you know, teach English in Korea, and I thought I'd do that too. So for 10 months, I did that. And I was kind of thinking, oh, I'll just go home and do the usual things that all my other friends were doing, such as going to London and becoming bankers and stuff. Um, I ended up uh, staying, actually, getting a different job. Actually, in finance, in fact. But at least I was here, uh, where I felt happier. From the beginning, from my first time here, I wondered well, why they're not that bad, why, why they're basically no decent books in English on Korea. I mean, there, there's one, like the Mike Breen's book, The Koreans, that's kind of old though now, I mean, that, I mean he, he will tell you that. It, I mean, it is, I think, 16 years old now. And yeah, for quite some time, that, that's obviously been out of date, because Korea changes, uh, I mean, I think one year in Korea is like 10 years in my country in terms of social change and every kind of change. Uh, and so yeah, there needed to be some kind of new book, I think. And I think if there's something that doesn't exist in the world that you think should exist, and you can make it happen, then you should do it. So even before I joined The Economist, I was trying to write uh, a book about Korea. Uh, but of course, you know, I didn't have any credentials and nobody was interested. Then after I joined The Economist, oh, oh well, you know, we'll you know, send us a few chapters and we'll see. Uh, and that's how I ended up doing it. You, you stayed in Korea for, I think, a decade now. What is it that you like so much about Korea, you know, yeah. that made you stay, yeah. you know, year after year after year? And, and is it the warmth? Is it... Mm. Well, actually, I mean, I, I've spent about three and a half years away from Korea during that time. So I've not been here all the time. I've been here a total of about seven years, I would say. What keeps me sort of coming back here? Yeah, I think if you've got a good friend in Korea, that's a really good, really good, good friend. You can sort of sacrifice everything for each other. And uh, I mean, England, I'm, yeah, I love my country, obviously, but um, we can be a bit cynical, a little bit cold. And uh, when I first came here, it was, wow, you know, there's this, this connection you can have with people. It's, it's really quite amazing. Uh, and so it's probably that. So your, your first book, Korea, The Impossible Country, mm. is about explaining Korea yeah. to people who have never been to Korea. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, but what is your, new, your newest mm. book, A Geek in Korea? Mm. It seems more like advertising, so to speak. Yeah, I don't, right, I don't mean right, in a right, negative right. way. No, that's fine. That's are you fine. trying to bring people to Korea? Or? Yeah, I mean, actually, a lot of the, the basic ideas are very similar to Impossible Country, but it's just presented in a more accessible, fun sort of way. I mean, I, my mum had a hard time reading the first one. She was like, oh, it's a bit dry and boring. Um, um, but she really enjoyed this one. And yeah, it's kind of, it is kind of an advert for Korea in the sense that 
I mean, if you look at the design of it, it's it's kind of targeted at young people uh, and maybe people who are interested in K-pop and drama and all this kind of stuff. And so it's me trying to say, well, you know, all this kind of cheesy pop music. By, by the way, I don't like K-pop, but anyway, but all all this pop music that you're interested in, uh, there's actually a country that is making this. And so why don't you now try and have a look at this country? So speaking of Korean culture. You, the, the title of your newest book is Discovering Asia's New Kingdom of Cool. Yeah. So I think my question is, mm. why is it cool and why is that a new thing? Uh, I think it's it's becoming cool. If I look back 10 years, I'd tell people I'm going to Korea. They go, what is that? Is that part of China? North or South? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So people knew absolutely nothing about Korea. And now uh, suddenly, if I go home, people ask me, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist in Korea or not. They go, wow, Korea! And they, they know something about it now, whether it's Gangnam Style or whether it's um, the electronic gadgets that are in their pocket. There's, there's just more of a sense generally that Korea is a country that we need to be paying attention to. So I suppose in that sense it's cool. I, mean, I don't want to rely on the whole K-pop stuff and uh, I'm not really a fan of all that stuff. But um, I think it's a, obviously a rising country. But beyond uh, mm-hmm. the, the Korean success story, we do see, you know, huge appeal. And where does that appeal come from? You know, how come we have more and more students in Europe who want to mm. learn Korean? You know, because mm. it's more than just the fact that there is a new trade partner, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Korea was behind for a long time. If you compare its economic status to its cultural status, and I think it's just natural now that its cultural status is catching up. So I don't think we should even think of this as. Yeah, wow, Korea. I think we should just consider it as, well, this is this is the way it should be. And if you compare the numbers of people who are interested in Japanese language with the number of people who are interested in Korean language or the Chinese language, I think Korea still has a bit of a way to go. But yeah, it's coming. So I think the embodiment of this new, the rise of Korean culture mm. abroad is, you know, the, the Korean way abroad, the Hanyu. Yeah, 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 yeah. How does it compare to the Japanese way that we had, you know, in the 80s and the 90s? And how, why is it so successful? Well, I think we'll have to see whether it's as long-lasting. Um, I think the the Japanese thing has... I mean, although Japan is considered, oh, economically, it's not as fantastic as it used to be. I think the cultural stuff, you still get these people who are really, really into Japan. Uh, and we'll have to see whether that lasts for Korea, because right now I think it's very much focused on the TV shows and then pop music. And, you know, when those kids grow up, they're not going to listen to Super Junior anymore, I guess. Uh, and so there needs to be something else. I think mm. there needs to be more, um, more, more depth and breadth to it. So I still think it's a bit early to say. I mean, I think there's a lot of really good stuff, like really good cultural, uh, uh, you know, creative content in Korea. But that's not necessarily been uh, promoted outside Korea yet. You're mentioning in, in your book, uh, The Impossible Country, that mm. uh, Hongdae is this place where there's a lot of great music being produced, mm. but nobody hears about it, mm. abroad especially. Mm. Um, do you feel that there's, you know, the government or just generally there was a huge, you know, focus on K-pop mm. at the expense yeah. of everything else? I, mean, I think it goes back to this 1960s idea of the national champions. Like the government will pick, okay, um, these people are most likely to do well, therefore we'll direct resources to them and everyone else can just, you know, yeah, whatever. Um, and I think, I think K-pop is similar. I mean, the government does put uh, huge res- well, I don't know about huge, but anyway, it puts a lot of money into promoting K-pop overseas. Also, you'll get, I mean, I don't know who exactly is responsible for it, but when you get a big K-pop concert in a place like France or Britain, the government will go all out to get that stadium full. And somebody will be pushing the Korean press to report on it. Oh, K-pop is huge in France and huge in London, even though, you know, you talk to your friends back home, actually, uh, what is that, you know? <laughs> Um, so I think there's, there's a lot, there's a big focus on pushing these certain acts and certain types of uh, yeah, music, certain types of TV show to the detriment of other, yeah, I would say more artistic things even. And so does it serve a domestic function? Is I think it, so. Does so it's trying to create some kind of yeah. sentiment of pride? Or I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, we've had this concert, uh, yeah, 15,000 people in Paris have attended this K-pop concert. Now, I mean, maybe 14,000 of them were, you know, Korean yuakseng. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> we got 15,000 people in that stadium. Uh, it's probably a bit like that, I think. Uh, I mean, it's the same reason that you get, um, you know, people like, you know, Seo kyung this professor who promotes these Korean sort of the dokdo cause. Yeah. And it always does it in the New York Times. I think it's like trying to show something. We're doing this in America. And Cafe Bene has the New York uh, cafe. Uh, 
And so often it's about, I think, showing people in Korea, look, we're going to these so-called world cities, these, you know, wonderful places, mm. uh, but probably you're just wasting money, actually. What can Korea achieve with its cultural exports in terms of soft power? Does, is mm. K-pop in any use in, in that field? Maybe. Um, I mean, a friend of mine is married to a quite a well-known actor here, and she and her husband were invited to Iraq, she was telling me, and the president of Iraq loved the show that he was in, and also millions of other Iraqis did too. And they were shown around and given absolute royal treatment the whole way through. And you know, it did seem from what she said that people in Iraq had a much more favorable impression of Korea than they did before because of this TV show. So yeah, maybe it, it does help, yeah. So I think we can say Hollywood is now definitely a thing, right? Yeah, sure. But Korea used to be considered a very conservative country with yeah. a strong you know, Confucian tradition. Mm. So h how did Korea's cool factor come to pass? Does it, has it been enabled by an evolution of the mentalities or... Tough question. Um, <laughs> tough question. I mean, I think the, the stuff that's really spread abroad, or at least to Asia, mm. is this um, very top-down pop culture that is in some ways... I mean, you look at the, the people who are dancing up on the stage, they don't look Confucian and they don't look conservative. But I think that the, the company behind them is quite conservative. And there's still that element of uh, there's a big boss man driving all this. I think the real rebelliousness is in places like Hongdae, mm. um, if we can call it rebellion, but yeah, rebellion of sorts. I mean, just the other day, um, it blew my mind, actually. I was, I was in uh, uh, Café Bene in Hongdae and um, I saw two, two men kiss each other not not in you know in a sexual fashion yes. it was wow i've never seen anything like that here i mean you don't see much of it in my country and I thought, wow korea's changing <laughs> even one or two years ago i couldn't imagine that so you mentioned um, how the world cup 2002 mm. played a very important role in your life mm. um but i think it also played an important role in you know opening korea to the world and, and for the world to know about korea mm -hmm. so can you maybe talk a bit about this about that and how it also plays in terms of Korea opening and, and having yeah. this transition in terms of values. Okay, I mean, I, I can't really prove this, but my own, my own theory is that uh, World, the World Cup was the, probably the first time in which you've got interaction on a big scale between Koreans and the outside world in a way that was beneficial and fun for each side. And so this idea that you've got people from another country coming here and you can, you can watch the game with them, you can drink with them, you can laugh... Uh, I think that was a quite a novel experience, probably for a lot of Koreans. I mean, the, the Olympics are often considered like the, the big coming out moment, but I think that was more of an economic thing. This was more about, the 88 thing was more like, we're an economic success. Look at our burgeoning wealth and power. Uh, whereas 2002 was more about people, I think. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it, it opened the door for possibility of more friendship and mutual understanding. So you mentioned in your book that Korea graduated from what you call defensive nationalism yeah. into a new type of nationalism or patriotism mm. that is more mm. about pride and confidence. Can you maybe explain yeah. you know, the, the two? I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that's still, it's still sort of in progress. But, um, but yeah, I think certainly for you know, centuries, Korea's been this kind of stepping stone or a uh, you know, pawn in the game of bigger, more powerful countries. So naturally, I think Koreans have felt we, we need to sort of preserve our uniqueness, whatever that may be. Um, we need to unite when trouble comes along. Um, I think under, in normal times, Korea is such a divided country, but then you get something like uh, IMF, you know, economic crisis, 1997, 98, that kind of thing. Uh, and then people will just unite. Like, we're being attacked by these bloody foreigners. Yeah. I think that, there was that kind of nationalism. Uh, and if you ask Koreans sort of off the record... You know, what do you think about your country? Very, very critical. But then typically in front of foreigners or in front of a big group, they have to, oh, you know, our country is the most wonderful place. Uh, but really inside of it all, there's this kind of negativity and self-doubt. Yeah, well, in your mm. book, Walla Walla, you, of course, welcome, yeah. you know, this transition. At the same time, you say that this old-style nationalism mm. is a good thing because it makes Korea very resilient yeah, to some, nation, Yeah, to right? some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it would be good to sort of temper it a little bit. But yeah, when the chips are down, getting getting together, helping each other out, I think it yeah, you know, it's it can be very positive. So you mentioned that the mm. that the World Cup two thousand two opened Korea up to the world, and, and uh, but the, my, my my question would be, we are seeing that Korea nowadays is way more multicultural. Uh, mm. Of course, mm. from no foreigners to 
Yeah. A few for it. Zero, zero, so zero to one is an increase of uh, infinity percent. Exactly. Right? So it's quite something. And is this the result of this changing Korean identity or is it the cause? Mm. Uh, you can say both, I guess. I think Koreans are more willing to accept people from other countries. And people often mention this you know, idea that um, poor guys in the countryside can't find wives. So bringing women from poorer Asian countries and that inevitably opens Korea up to some extent. So I think it goes both ways. And also a lot of Koreans are traveling abroad. They travel abroad and rather than say in the past, I think people would go, they go to America, they get their degree from Harvard and they come back. And when they're in Harvard, they're hanging around with Koreans the whole time. Uh, whereas now, I mean, that's, that's still going on, but you're getting Koreans who travel the world and go backpacking. And they come back, yeah, and they've got all these friends from Bolivia and Russia and wherever. And so I think that also can play into it. Do you think, do you think there's an important role to all these shows mm. that, you know, portray foreigners more and more in a positive way? I mean, one example mm. would be Abnormal Summit or Non-Summit, uh, the, as it's Sun, yeah. I mean, some of the, of the participants have become you know stars yeah yeah actually i was asked to be on that show uh, and i I didn't want to do it but in some i mean it can be good i think it's better than it's better than say in the past where it was just oh here's this big-nosed horrible businessman who is trying to you know steal from our country and screw our women uh but now it's i mean now it's more like you know what do you think uh which is good but still i don't like the idea of just oh here's a bunch of foreigners uh, we put them in a room and ask them, do you like kimchi or whatever? I, I, I don't like that. Uh, and I'd rather, you know, let's say you've done something. I don't know, you've climbed Everest or you've, you've made a film or something. So, they, so now you can talk about it, mm-hmm. as, as would happen for a, a Korean person. So you wouldn't get just any Korean guy and put them on KBS. You know, there would have to be a reason. But I think if you're foreign and you can make one sentence in Korean, then you get this privilege of... Uh, I was I was talking to a friend of mine about this today, and she's a Korean who speaks French. And uh, I was saying to her, "Well, you know, if I if I can make a few sentences in Korean and I like Chongguk-jang, then you know I can go on Korean TV, and everyone goes, wow, it's very cute.' But you know, if she likes French onion soup and speaks French, no French broadcaster is going to ask her to go on French TV, right?" So we've been talking uh, um, about how cool Korea mm. is. My question would be: Is this going to end? Mm. Especially if we compare the Hallyu wave with um, the Japanese wave with J-pop. Mm. Um, nobody really talks about that anymore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that whole, you know, the K-pop thing and maybe even the drama thing, I think that will have its lifetime, you know, its life cycle. But I think I mean, these days more and more people are coming to Korea I and mean, the tourist numbers are just through the roof. Um, and you can see that the amount of hotels being built around, I mean, yeah, it's just testament to that. More people are coming here on business uh, and as students, so exchange students as well. And... There's going to be a long-term, a longer-term, broader trend of just people knowing more about all kinds of things about Korea. But I think the Hallyu stuff, I mean, maybe that can be a gateway for some people. But generally, I think the K-pop, the idol groups, I mean, it's all kind of the same. I mean, I can't really distinguish, you know, who is Big Bang and who is Super Junior, frankly. Uh, and I'm sure their fans would be disgusted to hear that. But anyway, uh, that, that's, I think that's just the outsider to K-pop's perspective. And I think as that sort of cohort of fans grow up, either they have to find a new group of fans or K-pop has to evolve. I don't know, but I think it's... I mean, for me, it will be a, a wave. You know, it can't last forever. But I think Korea as a... I mean, the broader Hallyu, mm. you know, the country wave can, can last a very long time. But I think perhaps it has geographical boundaries. This stuff is dominating places like Thailand and Taiwan... It's very popular in China and Japan, but I don't see it going much beyond. Yeah, I don't see it going, say, to Europe, for example. Mm. So to conclude on, on Hallyu, um, you mentioned how, how it's supported by the government. Yeah, In the right. end, it's actually heavily subsidized. Can something that is subsidized by a central government... Ever be re- cool. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, that's, that's something I like to say a lot, yeah. Um, I think perhaps if they do it in a very sly and you know, under-the-surface kind of way, mm. but if it ever becomes known, then it's definitely not cool. Uh, I think certainly how they did this with Korean food. I mean, the, the previous government, Lee myung government, uh, actually the, the wife of the president, she was given this big budget and they were spending loads and loads of government money on promoting Korean food around the world. And the, the flagship project was this $5 million Korean restaurant in New York. By all accounts, it was pretty boring. Uh, because, you know, it's not going to be like a down-to-earth kind of, you know, 
it's not going to be a fun place. It's going to be fine dining, as imagined by civil servants, which probably isn't very good. I want to ask you about various opinion surveys uh, that were published in, in the last okay. years, um, especially the BBC World Public Opinion Survey, yeah. that show that Korea is by no means extraordinarily popular. Yeah, right, right, right. It's still quite... Uh, I think Because a lot of people don't understand Korea, or they get it confused with South Korea and North Korea. And yeah, still, sometimes when I go home, people will say, oh, are you in North or South Korea? So, it's changing. But, yeah, the, these surveys give me the, the, the impression that it really depends on your age group. Okay, right, right, right. Is, is right, that right. correct? I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, people my age or younger, back home, they, yeah, they'll know something. Yeah, Whereas yeah. people my parents' age won't know. That's what you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, is that you're mm -hmm. writing the, your newest book for the younger yeah, generations, younger audience, right? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they yeah. are the ones who are yeah. interested in Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, so I think it depends what country mm. you, you ask people in as well. I mean, probably the UK, I would say we know less about Korea than, say, Americans do. Because they've got all this, this history with Korea. Um, yeah, I mean, the average person in Britain still doesn't know very much about this place. And um, probably just occasionally sees stuff about North Korea on TV. Thinks, oh, Korea, oh, there's, there's a war going on there. Therefore, it's bad, you know. Korea always wants to portray itself as, you know, this amazing country in the eyes of yeah. the Western yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, nations. Yeah. But interestingly enough, how you more or less failed in the Western world, yeah, whereas right, right, it's right. unbelievably popular in Southeast Asia. Right. So doesn't it show that they kind of maybe failed? On, yeah, on yeah, that? yeah. If you look at the kind of products that are being offered, I mean, it's quite natural for Hallyu to be successful in, say, Thailand, because if you compare the Thai local pop music with Korean pop music, Korean pop music is clearly better produced. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, if you're in America, then you're, you're dealing with Beyonce and whoever. And so it's, it's more difficult to compete. Also, I think a Western audience will expect Western languages, particularly US, UK, will expect English. And yeah, uh, no matter what the government does, you, you can't really change that, I think. So K-pop and mm -hmm. um, Korean dramas, they depict, you know, a picture of Korea mm -hmm. that is extremely positive, of course, but it's far away from reality sometimes, yeah. right? I think if you watch the drama shows, I mean, you, I mean if, if, you, if you've never been to Korea and you just watched a few of these TV dramas, you'd think that everyone in Korea was from a Jebel family uh, or was a very poor but beautiful girl who was torn between some guy from a Jebel family and some very nice guy And then any other person would be a horrible Ajima who's trying to uh, break up true lovers from their destiny. And then you would also think that uh, Korea probably has the highest rate of cancer in the world because somebody in that show will definitely get cancer and die. <laughs> yeah, so this is interesting. It's, there is a discrepancy between mm. you know, the image of Korea mm. and, and how also it's received. Right? Yeah. Like, as you mentioned, how, how, how so many people now around the world are interested mm. in Korea. Yeah. But do they know about all the things that Koreans complain about? You know, the right, harsh right, right, educational right. system, the yeah. suicide rates. The funny thing is, I think all those things are now. There's a lot of attention on those things mm -hmm. now. There's, you know, I used, I used to write about those things, and yeah, you know, still you get you know, most of the Western press in Korea will churn out these articles on a regular basis. You know, Korea's number one in the world for suicide, uh, number one for plastic surgery, and that plastic surgery thing is driven by competition rather than vanity. I would say. Yeah, number one for children feeling stressed, mm. that that kind of thing. So there's, there's all kinds of, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's increasingly known though to the outside world or people who are interested in Korea. Uh, but perhaps if if you're a fan of K-pop, maybe you wouldn't know about that. In the 2014 Global Gender mm. Gap Report, mm. Korea ranked 117th out of 142 surveyed countries, mm. just below mm. Qatar in the UAE. Yeah. So what does that tell us about... Um... Well, I think there's a generation thing going on as well. I, I think that perhaps young Korean guys, maybe even 20s, pretty much like guys in my country, I think, in the sense that they're probably a little bit sexist, but you know, not to that kind of shocking extent. But the older generation is still very, very... Uh, very much of this, I think, this mentality that you know, the woman belongs in the kitchen, or at least in the home, uh, and the man is out there You know, making the money. I think for the younger generation, by necessity, the women have to work. Also, I think we're reaching a point where women do not want to have babies. We've already reached that point. They don't want to have babies because you know, you're expected to work now. Your husband might not necessarily want to help out with household stuff, looking after your kids. And there's not very much in the way of government support for uh, you know, childcare. Uh, and so there will, I think, inevitably have to be a change. Help women, hmm. uh, pay them more equally, 
uh, help them look after their kids, make it a sort of a socially correct thing for men to be involved in raising children. Uh, otherwise, this whole aging population problem and sort of imbalanced division between generations is, is obviously going to get worse. Mm. Korea's success is, I think, an inspiring example to many developing countries. Sure. And you also touch yeah. upon that in your book. Is Korea capitalizing on this success? Is it trying to be a role model? And is it doing it just in an ethical way? Or is there, mm, is there again some soft, power, interesting, soft yeah. power there? Now, I used to get emails from government agencies while I was still working at The Economist advertising Semal uh, Lundong, you know, this new village movement, which was Park jong big thing in the 70s. They're exporting that to countries like Rwanda. Now, Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, who yeah, he, he basically he's he's very Park Chung He like yeah he he's a dictator, but he's presiding over very impressive economic growth. And I think there's a sense in which this government there's this element of kind of not being embarrassed about the past. And we to make the omelet we had to crack a few eggs, and so what? I think that image is being pushed a little bit abroad with mm. this uh, Samuel Dong promotion. There's still this idea in Korea that, oh, we're a small country, um, you know, little old us, you know. But now, uh, places like Cambodia, um, you've got, you know, the, the Korean embassy there working very closely with the security apparatus to put down protests by the garment workers who are working mm -hmm. in Korean factories. And Cambodian security forces have acted with pretty extreme violence and you know, killed people on a number of occasions. And I think Korea now has to start to be aware that it's not just a little tadpole. Korea's actions in the world will have some consequences. So now I'd like to talk about the other side. There is South Korea, of course, but mm. there's also North Korea. And um, I'm afraid that outside of Asia, the term Korea oftentimes brings to mind North mm. Korea first. Sure. So what role does North Korea play on international audiences understanding of South Korea and of the peninsula. In, well, I think obviously, it, is it a scary yeah. thing? Or yeah, I think it, it confuses people and gives South Korea an unnecessarily severe image problem. Because hmm. uh, a lot of people obviously can't differentiate between the two, which is very sad. But yeah, I think also it takes a lot of the attention away from South Korea because, I mean, North Korea, you know, let's say South Korea, well, you know, there's an election, there's a new president, or um, some big event happens in South Korea. Well, if North Korea launches a nuclear rocket, then clearly no one's going to care what's going on in South Korea. Uh, you put Kim Jong-un or his father or his father's father on the cover of The Economist, then a lot of people will buy the magazine. If you put um, Park Geun-hye or Lee Myung-bak, Noh mi any South Korean president, people just go, who's that? Mm. And that's a very sad reality. So in your, in your second book, uh, A Geek in Korea, you mm. also talk about North Korea, but since you want people to come to the peninsula, you mm. also talk about it in terms yeah, of... A little bit. Tourism, so it has a travel destination. Mm. So, um, how can you explain this this fascination that people have for North Korea? Because after all, it is a yeah. I think it's because it's so exotic. It's not yeah. a place you can just get on a plane and go to. They have this nuclear weapons program. They have a, a government that was communist and is now a monarchy. It's just so bizarre, really, from the outside perspective. And I think it's natural that people will be curious about it. Whenever they appear in the media, it's always you know threatening America with nuclear rockets, and so there's that element of. I mean, if you don't know North Korea, if you don't know about Korea, you would think this is a scary country that we mm. need to be afraid of. Whereas, I mean, we don't really need to be afraid of it, but if you're looking from a distance, it maybe looks a lot more scary than it is. But is it really a good thing that people want to go to North Korea and travel there? Is it? Isn't there some kind of morbid fascination yeah. for the misery there maybe because disaster tourism doesn't really seem to be a yeah. good thing no I mean I tend to be of the view that um, whenever you can have a person from another country meeting a North Korean any kind of exchange I tend to view it positively uh, even though the um, the background to the the meeting may be negative or strange in some way uh, there's also I mean also of course there's this argument you know don't spend money in North Korea because it's going to the regime. I was about to ask. Uh, I, but also, a lot of it will go to the person who's driving the bus and the people who work in the hotel and the people who make the food. Uh, it helps them to live. I mean, I've been to North Korea, mm -hmm. so that's that's where I stand on it. But I, you know, I absolutely understand if people have a different view. And yeah, the North Korean regime is completely disgusting and inexcusable. But I tend to be of the view that if I can go there and talk to people and maybe present 
a more reasonable face of the West. Some would meet me and think, well, oh, he's not you know, a fascist imperialist who wants to bomb our country. Then, you know, maybe, who knows? So I'm sure you heard about the UN report mm. on the, the human rights situation yeah, course, in North Korea. Course, yeah. It seems that for the first time, mm. uh, instead of just dismissing it, North Korea is actively engaging yeah, right, 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 right. What, 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 do you, what do you read into this? Um, I think that uh, they know that... Because I mean, these days, I mean, North Koreans, they can't... I mean, the North Korean government, they can't keep information from leaving North Korea and they can't keep information from going into North Korea. So I think they have to engage with it more and they have to be more subtle about it. I mean, it's the same with um, so South Korean TV shows that come into the country on USB sticks. Mm -hmm. The government has changed its propaganda in response to the fact that there's something like more than half of the population of North Korea has seen South Korean TV. So they know that South Korea isn't desperately poor and is significantly richer than their country is. So now they've changed their propaganda to say, well, maybe they've got loads of money, but they're an American puppet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have to respond to these things. I think now the, the flow of information is, is greatly increased uh, in, in both directions. And so I don't think they can simply deny in the way that they used to. Hmm. I'd like to conclude the, uh, the interview with um, a question on the future. First, Korea's future. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that this whole thing about Hallyu will slowly yeah. disappear and will be replaced mm -hmm. by the next big thing, maybe an ASEAN yeah. country that rises to oh, yeah, glory. Knows, yeah. um, mm. Do you see Korea becoming multicultural or following on the footsteps of Japan? What is your general impression of... Um, Hallyu, I think, the, the, the main prongs of the Hallyu fork will I don't know, fall off, be blunted, whatever. Mm. I'm trying to think of a way to finish this horrible metaphor. But yeah, I think K-pop and the drama thing will eventually be replaced, but that won't stop the rest of Korea being known because people are coming here more than before and people are more likely to have a Korean friend, Koreans are more likely to go abroad. Uh, and so I think it's just natural that Korea will be better known and will take its place in the world as Japan has done. I think that Korea will be as well known as Japan, uh, as popular as Japan eventually. Last question yeah. about you, Daniel Tudor. Mm. Um, you are telling everybody to come to Korea yep. and see the country for uh, themselves. No, I'm leaving. <laughs> exactly, and you're right, leaving, right. so can you maybe tell us uh, yeah. what's next? Um, apparently you have a startup. Right, right. Uh, a Korean friend, actually, we're going to London. Uh, we're opening up a uh, crowdfunded journalism platform, uh, and we've, we've received commitments from investors. We're going to have six people working on it all together uh, in, a, in an office somewhere in London. And yeah, it's very serious and it's, we think, a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I don't really want to leave Korea, but Will I'll come back? Yeah, I'll come back. I mean, if, if I don't do this, I'll regret it. If we succeed and I end up in a few years becoming some super rich target of everyone's hatred, then, uh, <laughs> then I will, yeah, I'll come back anyway because I like it. Uh, if the business fails, then I'll just come back sooner. Daniel, mm. good luck with your venture. Thank you very and, much. And um, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.